I'm going to be joined in this next session by Rebecca Corbett, who's the assistant managing editor of the New York Times in charge of investigations, uh, just to help me out and all of us out. So as by way of introduction, we, we started this project about a year ago, or a little over a year ago at the IRP, starting to look at the phenomenon of Russia and, and Putin and Trump and, um, and whether or not there was a bigger story here or a story that we could possibly provide something on that was new. And early on in, the, in my reporting and, and going to Washington, I started meeting with uh, people I've known in the FBI and in the intelligence community, and I was struck, even more recently, by uh, reactions of people to what was going on. And in one case, I'm sitting with a uh, now former supervisor in the FBI who speaks Russian, who was uh, the legal attache at one point in, in Moscow, um, was, a, was very familiar with the subject area, the individuals, and we were having coffee out on the street uh, at a cafe uh, near FBI headquarters. And at one point, um, he got up and he pointed to the, towards the White House and said something I'd never heard before, particularly from an FBI agent or a member of the intelligence community. Pointing at the White House, he said, that's the biggest threat to the national security of the United States. And with that, I'd like to show you part of what I think he had in mind. Can we show the video clip? Russia is fake news. Russia, this is fake news put out by the media. What exactly is your relationship with Vladimir Putin? I have no relationship with Putin. I have no relationship with Putin. Vladimir Putin, have you ever met the He's guy? A tough guy, I met him once. I never met Putin, I don't know who Putin is. He said one nice thing about me. He said I'm a genius. I said thank you very much to the newspaper. And that was the end of it. I never met Putin. I was in Russia. I was in Moscow recently. And I spoke indirectly and directly with President Putin, who could not have been nicer. Well, Donald Trump likes Putin. I don't know Putin, folks. I don't know. I hope I like him. I hope he likes me. Because I'd love to get along with Russia. OK? I have no relationship with Putin. I don't think I've ever met him. I never met him. I don't think I've ever you met him. You would know it if you did, I think you? so. Yeah, I think so. So I've, I don't think I've ever met him. I mean, if he's in the same room or something, but I don't think so. Okay. So what I hope to do for the symposium, and I may still be able to do the, with the film project that we are doing with Jigsaw Productions, is to produce some of the people that I met with in the last number of months who are now recently out of the intelligence community and the FBI and who had some very strong things to say about the current situation, particularly in the wake of the uh, firing of Andrew McCabe um, and about the assault on the, what, we, what some people call uh, the deep state, what I, what I would call the professional bureaucracy of the intelligence and FBI communities, federal law enforcement communities. But when I talked with all of them, uh, they suggested that I introduce you to someone who can talk, because all of these guys, they were all men, um, said that they were currently working for various banks and corporations, and they said that, that their employers, their current employers, did not want them to talk. So this person is someone who introduced the national audience today to the word catastrophe. he'll have to tell me what it is, cacastro, I don't know what it is. <laughs> You're going to have to do it. So here's our mystery guest, the former head of the CIA, John Brennan. So John, maybe you could tell us what the word is and why you used it. And what does it mean? The word is kakasakashi, and it refers to uh, government by the least capable, um, uh, least competent, worst individuals in society. Basically the opposite of an aristocracy of sorts. It's uh, ancient Greek. Um, and so I just, I had not thought of it since my uh, philosophy classes at Fordham many, many years ago. But uh, it uh, has come to mind recently over the last uh, number of months. And so I just thought that uh, I might put that out in a tweet um, because I, I do feel strongly that uh, 
I need to call out Mr. Trump on a number of issues, and I've used uh, that platform uh, to voice some of my concerns, but also to make sure that we don't cede that platform to him, uh, given his, I think, very well-deserved reputation of dishonesty, lack of integrity, lack of ethics, and, and uh, so on. So I just thought that that word captured in one word uh, what uh, I see as the, uh, the Trump administration's uh, most, I think, prominent trait and quality. You've called the president a charlatan. You've likened him to a narcissistic, vengeful autocrat, a demagogue, demagogue who will wind up in the dustbin of history. Got anything nice to say? Yeah, and, and I've been criticized, and I can understand why, uh, using such language directed against a person who is in the Oval Office and the Chief Executive and Commander-in-Chief. Uh, I use charlatan because I do think that he is, just like uh, most demagogues, uh, he, is, he is preying upon the fears and concerns of individuals. He is uh, presenting a, a view and proposals uh, to to resolve and solve very complicated problems, uh, much like a snake oil salesman. And uh, it really has uh, made my, uh, my Irish temper come to the surface on a number of occasions when I hear him or read what he says. And uh, I feel an obligation to speak out. I know a number of my former colleagues, as you noted, Lowell, would like to be able to speak out, uh, but their uh, current situation might not allow them to do that. Uh, my speaking out has not been cost free. I think I mentioned to you that uh, there were a number of um, opportunities and offers that I had that were in fact rescinded uh, because of my outspokenness. But uh, as my three and a half decades of uh, in government service demonstrate, I was never really driven by financial gain. Um, I feel a very strong uh, personal conviction to be able to uh, use my, my previous experience, national security and government, uh, to uh, call out individuals who are not fulfilling, I think, their solemn responsibilities and obligations to lead this country at a very critical time of our history. And I think Mr. Trump does not have the uh, temperament, the experience, uh, the disposition, um, nor, as I mentioned, the integrity, ethics, and honesty to be the person who has that responsibility in the United States to uh, make sure that the United States is able to navigate the many, many dangerous shoals that we have in front of us and to uh, ensure that this country continues to be uh, safe, secure, free, prosperous uh, in the years ahead. I think as I noted in one of those tweets recently that I have worked for six presidents, three Democrats and three Republicans. I'm not a member of any political party um, I'm an avowed nonpartisan, uh, and but I do believe that what Mr. Trump is is uh, demonstrating is the antithesis of what uh, the president of the world's greatest uh, democracy should be um, demonstrating to the world. Uh, he he is not uh, modeling either the behavior or the um, attitude, sentiment, or approach that I think that we need in this time of tremendous domestic political polarization and a great international challenge. So um, yes, I will use the 280 characters uh, that I'm given every time I tweet to speak very forcefully and sometimes uh, in the minds of some very brutally. Uh, but I, I feel very strongly that he is not somebody who deserves the uh, the, uh, the moniker of President of the United States, nor the responsibility to, uh, to uh, lead us. Put, put yourself in the position of uh, your former colleagues at the agency who, in your mind, have a, a com current commander in chief who you are describing in, in ways that would make it very difficult. If you were there now, what, what would you be thinking if you were getting instructions and requests and uh, for analysis, for an opinion, for uh, actions, uh, how would you react if this man is a, a demagogue, a charlatan, and a vengeful autocrat? Well, he still is the President of the United States, and I have great confidence that my 
former colleagues at CIA, FBI, other parts of the intelligence community and national security infrastructure of the United States, uh, that they're carrying out their responsibilities professionally to the best of their ability. Uh, every day, I think they recognize that despite what he may say, denigrating their work, they recognize just how important it is to this country's future and security. And so um, wherever they are around the globe, um, I think that they are, most of them are, are quite disappointed in the rhetoric that they hear coming from the White House. They're quite disappointed in the, the commentary that he makes about the, their work. But I think uh, if you've been in CIA or FBI for a number of years, uh, you are used to this. Uh, you know that the political winds swirl around Washington and sometimes they're very unfavorable. But this is when you know, your medal is, is, is proved that you need to be able to focus on your work and not worry about the politics. Uh, that sometimes can be a very tough, tough uh, call, but I do believe that they carry it out. But there are a couple of constituencies that I'm very worried about in terms of the impact of Mr. Trump's comments. I speak to a lot of universities and colleges throughout the country. I'm affiliated with my two alma maters, Fordham University of New York and University of Texas at Austin, I'm trying to give back to them what I benefited from. Uh, and I'm concerned about those young Americans who are considering pursuing work uh, as an intelligence officer, as a FBI agent, as a diplomat. And I think that many of them are now questioning whether or not they should continue to go down that road when they know they could make two or three times their salary in the private sector. But I'm also worried about the families of those FBI agents and CIA officers, the ones who really make the sacrifices. The ones who have to keep the home fires burning uh, when their loved one has to go off to uh, Afghanistan or Iraq or somewhere else or stays late at, at, at the office. So I am concerned that the that young spouse, that young wife or, or husband will say to their loved one, honey, why are you doing this? We're, we're having a difficult time making ends meet. But yet the president of the United States is saying these, these, these things about your profession and doesn't appreciate it. So I am worried about that impact, but I think overall, the ones that are in the intelligence and security environment are carrying out their duties uh, faithfully. Let me ask you a more, a more specific question about the whole relationship of uh, Russia to the election and the Russia potentially to the president. When did you first become aware of it? The, the first press report I can see that you may have been aware was back in April of 2017. But when were you first, were you first approached by the British or who, who first came to you and said, uh, we have some indication that the Russians are attempting to interfere in the election and or Donald Trump is their favorite candidate? I think you may have meant April 2016, not 2017. 2016, yeah, okay, sorry. Well, I think, you know, being in the intelligence profession, and, and I know what the capabilities are of my Russian counterparts and how they have tried to involve themselves in elections over the years, whether it be in Europe or the United States, I think we were uh, attuned to the potential for it. Uh, and I don't want to be able to, I don't want to, and I shouldn't provide any specific date when it really um, hit that the Russians were uh, involved in this. But I think as we were, um, Going from 2015 to 2016, our radar was up. Uh, we were looking for indicators, as we do. Uh, sometimes there are subtle indicators that you don't know whether or not they are dispositive of a real uh, effort on the part of the Russians. But I think, as you pointed out, in, in the spring, there were already some press reports about it uh, based on some things that uh, were happening. And then it started to build in the latter part of the spring and then the summer. And I think uh, some of the things that we were uh, seeing and observing were probably most uh, apparent uh, in the middle of uh, 2016. Rebecca, you? Mr. Brennan, experts seem to disagree um, on the degree to which. Um, on the degree to which Putin personally micromanages operations like the 2016 election meddling. Do you think he personally gave the orders? for the release of the hacked emails? Do you think he directs his close associated associates to attack Clinton, praise Trump, and put out lots of inflammatory material? Or do you think people know what he wants and take the initiative in order to win his favor? Well, I think it's, uh, it's both. Um, in the intelligence screen assessment that, that came out in early January of uh, 2017, 
uh, we said with great confidence, with high confidence, uh, Russia was trying to interfere in the election, uh, trying to hurt Hillary Clinton, tried to help Donald Trump. NSA only had moderate confidence on that latter judgment, but that it was authorized and directed by Vladimir Putin. And so I have great confidence that Vladimir Putin was the one who authorized this, gave that direction. At the same time, though, uh, I think the Russian intelligence services know what their mission is, know what their capabilities are, and will apply them to uh, issues that are of interest to Russia's national security. So I think there, they were ongoing collection efforts uh, that were underway uh, well in advance of what Mr. Putin might have authorized on the, on the active measures front. But I have no doubt in my mind that this type of interference in the U.S. presidential election in 2016, which was, I think, unprecedented in terms of its scope and intensity and made full use of the digital domain, I have no doubt in my mind that Vladimir Putin personally authorized this, these activities. And despite claims by Trump's critics that he is soft on Russia, his, some defenders of his argue that his administration has actually accumulated a reasonably tough record in recent months. There were lethal defenses weapons to Ukraine, tougher sanctions than under Obama, now a second strike um, in Syria over Russian objections. Do you think the polarized politics of Washington have in some way distorted the view of his record on Russia? No, I, well, first of all, I'm glad that he is calling out the Russians now in a way that he didn't do before, for example, on Syria. He had some, I think, very uh, direct uh, comments about Russia and Iran supporting Bashar al-Assad. And I think that was good. And I think he also mentioned Vladimir Putin in some of those statements. Uh, as far as some of the actions that the Trump administration has taken, I think some of them were um, a result of strong congressional interest as well as strong executive branch. Uh, focus. And so moving forward on sanctions and some of these other measures, uh, such as responding in Ukraine or wherever, uh, I think uh, once he's confronted with a consensus and that there are some decisions that come up through the National Security Council process, I think he finds it uh, very difficult to, uh, to not uh, proceed. Uh, but he rarely has done it in his own name. Uh, these are U.S. government actions. But I, I do feel that at least over the last week or two, uh, he has been willing to call out the Russians uh, explicitly in a way that he doesn't, hasn't been before. And I think because he recognizes that he has been very criticized, and I think appropriately so, for having a rather submissive approach toward Mr. Putin in Russia. Mm -hmm. And going back to your um, rather unsparing public criticism of President Trump, now joined by former FBI Director um, Jim Comey, do you think it's appropriate for former top intelligence officials to be political pundits of sorts, um, or does it only feed Trump's view that the deep state is out to get him? Even inside the intelligence community, there has been some discomfort um, with this sort of outspokenness, and does it risk politicizing intelligence? Well, I think it certainly will be interpreted by some as just a reflection of the deep state is against Mr. Trump. And it's been used that way. I think there are other people who have been out on Fox News and other places that are pointing to my outspokenness. Uh, and I know that there are some people within the, including an intelligence community, and probably within CIA, that probably would wish that I wouldn't speak out. But a, a couple of things. One is that I am a private citizen. I am somebody who is going to take advantage of my uh, opportunities to exercise my freedom of speech in this country and to speak out uh, when I see that there is uh, wrongs, injustice, or um, what I think is a failure to uh, fulfill one's uh, professional responsibilities and governmental responsibilities, and that's the case. Secondly, although there are critics out there, I, I must tell you that I have had uh, many, many people uh, from uh, the intelligence community, from the national security environment, both former colleagues um, who have departed government, but also those who are in government, who have said to me uh, numerous times, thank you, John, for giving voice to our concerns. So, and I'm not doing it on behalf of them, but I have taken that into account. It's one of the reasons why I initially lashed out, which was just what, two days after the inauguration, when Mrs. Trump stood in front of the Memorial Wall at CIA, uh, 
where we had 117 stars representing every man and woman from CIA who gave their life for this country. And when he was going into his political speech and talking about the size of an old crowd, uh, my phone lit up with emails and text messages about how disgraceful that action was. And uh, that prompted me to issue a statement where I said it was a, a very a despicable display of self aggrandizement And uh, so I do feel as though I am reflecting the sentiments of a lot of individuals who, for whatever reason, are unable to uh, voice uh, their objections. The dismissal of Andrew McCabe uh, and the people that I talked with, they were just in shock that, that a senior government official who had no blemish on his record, at least until now, was treated publicly in the way that he was by President Trump and others. I wonder if maybe you could explain, I think, the depth of emotional reaction, at least that I ran into, from a variety of people in the Bureau, formerly in the Bureau, as well as in the intelligence community. Well, there, there were many months of just brutal uh, and public uh, criticism that uh, Mr. Trump levied against Andy McCabe, and uh, including against his wife, and making allegations about uh, some political um, uh, leanings of uh, Andy uh, and what he might have done in order to try to undermine uh, Mr. Trump. I, I have known Andy McCabe for many years. Uh, I know him to be a consummate professional, somebody who did his job uh, very well, someone who put in long years and hours in the service of his nation. Uh, and I now I know that also there's an intelligence, uh, a inspector general report that's come out that has criticized him for not being uh, forthcoming in terms of uh, responding to some of the IG questions. I don't know the facts of, of this case, but I thought the manner uh, that uh, the way Mr. Trump treated Andy McCabe, I thought was very, very um, uh, inappropriate. Uh, and I think the, the way that he was summarily dismissed for less than 48 hours before um, he was eligible to retire, yeah, I, I, I wonder whether or not in light of his, his service, even if he was guilty of the things that the IG report said, uh, and I talked with many former colleagues about this, we didn't feel as though the punishment fit the crime. For something like this, uh, someone may have been demoted, someone may have been suspended for a period of time or whatever, but to uh, fire somebody and uh, penalize them in, in that way, uh, I think there was a, a lot of people who said, even if he uh, was, was guilty of these things, it, it, it did not merit uh, that type of uh, punishment. And before, I'm gonna open up to questions in, in, uh, after this question uh, from the audience. Um, I have to ask you about the dossier. When did you, I, I've read in, in various, both conservative and other, uh, blog sites that you have were influenced by the dossier that it was a now uh, what we call famous uh, steel dossier in your opinions and the F and the CIA's assessment back in August that the Russians were interfering etc. Did it have any role? When did you first become aware of it? And what's your assessment of it? The first time I heard of it, it wasn't referred to as steel dossier. I was at a conference in Aspen, Colorado in late September of 2016, when some rather um, recognizable media uh, personalities were there and approached me uh, and asked me whether I had heard about these reports, uh, about what had taken place in Moscow. I said I had not heard about the report. I said, I know that there are a number of these allegations and rumors going around, but I don't know if they're valid or not but that Mr. Trump has had you know, a reputation of uh, maybe engaging in some of these, these types of activities. Uh, I didn't see the report until uh, December of 2016. And uh, the, the report in no way influenced the intelligence community assessment that the intelligence community did, CIA, FBI, NSA, and CIA, uh, and the DNI. Um, it was not used as a basis for any of the judgments that I was mentioning before. And as Jim Comey has said publicly and is in his book, uh, at the end of the briefing at Trump Tower in early January of 2017, Jim Comey stayed behind with Donald Trump alone 
and uh, brief them on it, uh, not to uh, make any, uh, any judgment about its validity, but just to make sure that the president-elect was aware of this report uh, as he is going to take the, the office of president. Uh, just so I'm clear, but in August of 2016, when you go to the leaders of Congress, when you go uh, to the National Security Council and President, then President Obama, this, with the CIA's assessment of what is going on, that was not based in any way on the dossier. I, I briefed what's called the Gang of Eight um, in the summer of 2016. Uh, and I had no uh, familiarity with the report at the time, had not seen it. Uh, I briefed those members uh, on what it was that CIA uh, had knowledge of, what our uh, reporting information uh, revealed, and the, the assessment that ultimately was done was the product of uh, months long of, of, of collection as well as of assessment. So when I briefed the Gang of Eight, I had no knowledge of the Steele dossier. I didn't brief any of it to anybody, despite some of the claims, uh, the various claims that, including that have come out reporting that the uh, House Intelligence Committee was uh, trying to uh, catch me in perjury. Uh, in no way uh, did any of that dossier uh, filter into uh, my briefings of the Gang of Eight in the summer of, of 2016. So just so I can get clear, you're not under investigation for perjury before any of the House, the House committee or other committees. And they are welcome to investigate me for perjury or anything else. Uh, and I stand behind what I, what I did and what I have said uh, in testimony. And if, have you been questioned by the Justice Department, the CIA's Inspector General, the Mueller investigation in any, in any form? Uh, no. We have questions. Now we could turn the camera around and let you see our audience. And way in the back, can we get him a microphone way in the back? Stephen Stock, NBC Bay Area. Given what you know and your continuing contacts with those still in the intelligence community, how vulnerable is the United States to more manipulation by Russia and other foreign actors for 2016 and 2018? It appears from my sources that very little has been done to address this. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have the insight uh, into what actually is happening inside of the government to try to prevent a recurrence of this type of interference in 2018 and 2020. Uh, I know that a lot of the professionals in the intelligence community at CIA, FBI, and NSA are working diligently to make sure that they are able to detect any type of attempted interference. Uh, I'm hoping they're also putting together some options to try to thwart that interference. Uh, but uh, at least based on the press reports I've heard, there's not been the type of attention given to it that I think it, it certainly deserves. But uh, even if uh, Mr. Trump does not give the orders, uh, I have uh, confidence that uh, the, those in the FBI, CIA, NSA, and other areas are uh, trying to uncover what the Russians or others might be trying to do. Um, Mr. Brennan, um, it's Rachel Oldroyd from the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in London. Um, is there anything you can say about Russian interference in elections in Europe? So um, UK's Brexit, France election, German election, even the uh, recent Italian election? Well, I, I've been out of government since January of 2017. So I don't have uh, insight into uh, password information or reporting uh, about some of those events. Again, I follow the press very closely. It appears as though the Russians continue to be active. I do know, though, from my previous experience that the Russians have taken full advantage of the openness of a number of the countries in Europe uh, to uh, carry out influence activities. And we were using some previous Russian efforts as, in some respects, a guidepost for us to look for indications the Russians were trying to do that in our country. For example, we know that the Russians have um, channeled money into the coffers of political parties or politicians who have uh, more favorable positions, uh, policy positions that would uh, advantage Russia. 
Uh, we know that they've tried to bolster the, the electoral prospects of individuals who are, are more sympathetic to, to Moscow. Uh, we know that they have uh, been able to suborn uh, individuals within the media. We know that they've been able to take over, in fact, some media outlets. Uh, so these are the, the mechanisms that the Russian intelligence security services have used in the, in the European theater. And uh, quite you know, frankly, uh, I think some the uh, number of the intelligence security services in Europe are neither capable enough nor independent enough to uh, guard against uh, those types of activities. So we were very concerned that the Russians might try to put money into some uh, of those election channels uh, inside of the United States in 2016. I think these are things that we have to be uh, worried about and concerned about. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised at all if the, if the Russians are continuing to do what they've done for many years, again, trying to influence the outcome of elections, because for them, it's a much more, it's a more insidious, but sometimes more effective way of shaping political events outside of their borders. I think they would much rather do that than roll tanks and uh, military personnel uh, over borders. Tom Burke, I'm with I'm a lawyer with Davis Wright Tremaine. My question for you is, do you have any regrets uh, that there weren't greater efforts uh, on your part or on the Obama administration uh, pre-election to notify the public or others uh, about what you saw happening? Yeah, I'm asked that question a lot. I was asked that question by the intelligence committees uh, on the Hill, both the Senate and the House. And I was able to review all of our actions during this period of time. And I, I can understand some of the people's concerns. Uh, I know Adam Schiff has spoken out, and I have a lot of respect for Adam Schiff, saying that we should have done more. And I respectfully disagree with him. Um, we were really uh, trying to strike the right balance between doing everything we could to prevent and thwart, as well as uncover and understand what the Russians were doing, without doing anything that was going to uh, almost advance their interests in trying to disrupt our election. Uh, and so if we did more things and we you know, stood on the, the hilltops and cried out, the Russians, the Russians are trying to help Mr. Trump get elected. And if President Obama, who is the titular head of the Democratic Party, were to do that, uh, I think there would have been a lot of people who would believe, I think with some justification, that uh, the President of the United States was trying to influence the outcome of a presidential election. And President Obama tried to make it very clear to us he didn't want us to do anything uh, in reality or in perception that would have advanced these Russian interests. So I think I was the first U.S. official to confront the Russians on August the 4th of 2016. I had a phone call with Alexander Bortnikov, the, uh, the Russian head of their Federal Security Bureau, their FBI, where I told him rather directly that if he were to go down this road, if the Russians were to go down this road, they would pay a significant price. I told them that all Americans would be outraged by a Russian effort to try to interfere in our election. I thought I was a better analyst because clearly not all Americans are outraged by those Russian activities. <laughs> and also, President Obama confronted President Putin on the sidelines of G20 in September. Uh, Jim Clapper, Director of National Intelligence, along with the Homeland Secretary Jay Johnson, uh, put out a public statement in October. And so, again, we were trying to very carefully um, balance our obligations to prevent what they were doing, but not uh, help them in their effort. And people said, well, we, why didn't we you know, put, go back at them symmetrically in the cyber world? Well, there, were, there was consideration about rattling their, their cages uh, with some type of cyber uh, event. But might that have, in fact, escalated the situation? And we know that they were navigating and uh, trying to map out the uh, architecture of some of the state uh, voter registration rolls and other things. They had things that they could have done that they didn't do. And I, might, I would argue that I think by pushing them back a bit and confronting them with it, both privately and as well as publicly, I think we did dissuade them from even going further. Now, it's a hypothetical as far as, you know, if we did X, Y, or Z, it would have had a, a different effect. But we did not want to further um, uh, or make the situation of uh, questioning the integrity of the election um, even more prominent. We were trying to protect that, that election. Uh, and so I, I feel good. I don't have regrets. Uh, now, President Obama was the ultimate decision maker on that. 
And, and I bet you, and I've had conversations with him, I think he's very, very comfortable with what we did and what we didn't do. Mr. Brennan, the United States has a long history of trying to influence um, public opinion, political views, and, um, um, and elections going back decades. So what's different here from what the Russians are doing and what the United States has historically done? And what the United States is accused of doing in Moscow in their last election? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, the CIA uh, has a, a long history of 70 years or so, and there were a lot of things that have come out in the, uh, the press about uh, efforts to try to influence the outcome of elections in the post-World War II environment and prevent communist takeovers. And I'm not going to try to relitigate history, but I will say that uh, it's been my experience that in this century, um, the presidents that I worked for, none of them, none of them was interested in trying to do anything to influence the outcome of an election. And they wanted to make sure that we, the United States, helped countries carry out elections in an open, fair manner. And so there were efforts to try to help strengthen some of their electoral institutions. But uh, the things of the, the last century that I'm not going to either try to defend or apologize for uh, were from the last century. But I, I am very proud that both Democratic and Republican presidents in this century uh, always were very committed to the, the principle that if we're going to be the, the beacon and the defender of worldwide democracy, we damn well better not try to influence the democratic outcome of those elections. And uh, that I hope that continues to be the case because I think it would be the, the height of, of antithesis uh, and, and irony that, that we would be trying to influence uh, the, the winners of these uh, democratic elections. Uh, Director Brennan, I recently interviewed somebody who's very well sourced in the intelligence and national security bureaucracy, and I asked him what he thought the response at the upper levels of the national security um, agencies would be if President Trump issued what they thought was an unwise, improvident order, and he said, oh, they'd slow roll him. They'd slow down the decision-making process, and they would try to limit the impact of the decision. Is that exactly what we've been seeing in Washington this past week, the president getting slow-rolled by Jim Mattis and others at the upper levels of the national security bureaucracy? Well, I guess one person's characterization of slow-rolling is another person's characterization of trying to talk common sense into President of the States. <laughs> I would say that, and I know Jim Mattis well, have tremendous respect for him. He is a, a true patriot and he is somebody who I think has the best interests of this country uh, first in his mind, not his own interests. And I do think that the, the, the strike against Syria that we witnessed uh, yesterday uh, was a reflection of his, Jim Mattis's and Joe Dunford's and and others' ability to uh, put a very realistic uh, prism uh, in front of uh, Donald Trump and to just to carry out these surgical strikes as opposed to something that was going to be, I think it's been reported that John Bolton wanted to be ruinous. So uh, if, if Donald Trump gives, gives orders that are clearly uh, in the minds of intelligence professionals or others counter to US national security interests, I think their first course of action will be to try to convince that uh, Donald Trump to take a different course. Uh, they may try to then temper maybe the implementation of those orders, but I, I do think that there are a number of individuals who would uh, not carry out uh, orders that they thought were uh, either um, illegal uh, or illogical or uh, dangerous to our national security. Uh, I don't believe that uh, the CIA would carry out a, a, a waterboarding uh, uh, program now. I don't think they would uh, carry out enhanced interrogation techniques. Uh, I'm hoping that that is the case. Uh, and that's why I do believe it's, and I've spoken out in support of Gina Haspel uh, to be the next director of CIA if Mike Pompeo gets uh, confirmed as Secretary of State because Gina is a professional. She is nonpartisan, apolitical. She understands the intelligence mission and will make sure that 
she keeps that foremost in his mind, in her mind. While uh, Mike Pompeo, while very smart and accomplished, uh, I think is a, uh, a partisan and a loyalist to Mr. Trump. And I don't like the fact that uh, the CIA is headed by a uh, political loyalist and partisan. Uh, Director Brandon, Ellen Weiss from Scripps. Um, I understand why in the fall of 2016, you might have not wanted to warn the American public what you knew, but what we've learned from some of the excellent reporting is that the Russian inter, uh, interference, both in our information institutions and also in our infrastructure, threatening both, went back years before, went back to 2014, perhaps as early as 2011. And I'm wondering if you think the Obama administration um, knew the severity of that threat and did enough um, in those earlier years when they saw what Russia was doing. Well, you know, I think one of the, the primary reasons why uh, 2016 was different than years past was the continued evolution and uh, availability of the digital domain for people who want to cause trouble. And I had responsibility when I was in, during the first uh, Obama term, I was down at the White House as his assistant for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, and cyber was in my portfolio. And during that, that my tenure there, as well as subsequently at CIA, um, cyber was the most vexing, complicated, complex problem I ever encountered in terms of how to try to protect and ensure the reliability, the integrity, the resilience uh, of that environment and protect it from being abused and misused by those who want to do us harm. I have been long an advocate for the Congress to call for an independent commission, just like what happened after 9-11, to set up a, uh, a body that will look comprehensively and strategically at what we need to do to protect our country's security and prosperity. Um, because that is the environment where most human activity takes place. And uh, there are actors, both domestic and international, who will use that environment to cause uh, trouble and to do us harm. And the Russians, unfortunately, are very adept and capable in terms of applying their trade, their intelligence uh, trade in that digital environment. So during the Obama administration, we were aware of it and tried to address it. But let's face it, that environment is owned and operated 85% by the private sector. The government does not have just the ability to wave a magic wand and say, okay, we're going to make this secure and we're gonna prevent the Russians from doing these things. This is a really tough challenge and this country needs to rise to it because again, our future depends on the health and security and resilience of that environment. And so I fully anticipate that the Russians and others are going to take advantage of the opportunities that are there. They're gonna to try to hide their footprints better. They're going to try to prevent uh, the US from understanding what may be happening there. But let's not make a mistake. That environment is ripe for malactors um, and they are going to continue to uh, cause us problems. So. I, what I thought in the Obama administration was done was to try to build upon some of the earlier work done in the Bush administration. And I'm hoping that that's going on in the Trump administration. Uh, that's why every successive administration should be trying to do more than what the previous administration was able to accomplish in its period of time. You passed the baton. But this digital environment, this cyber sphere, is one that every American should be concerned about as we go to more and more the Internet of Things, increased automation, artificial intelligence. Uh, that is a, a environment that doesn't protect, uh, doesn't respect sovereign borders. And we don't have a national consensus right now about what the government's role should be in that environment. You know what the uh, authorities are of the, of the police department in uh, your local jurisdiction. You know what the authority is of the TSA officials who uh, watch over our airports or the Coast Guard or whatever. But what is the role of the of the agreed upon role of the CIA, NSA, and FBI in that environment when technological advancements continue to thwart the ability of government to carry out the rule of law. For example, when somebody has uh, an iPhone with a breakable encryption that we all want and need, but it prevents the government from having access to something that could have information that is 
uh, indicating a major crime or a major attack is taking place. So I think that the digital domain is really challenging now the, the ability of governments to carry out the rule of law. And that's why I get on my soapbox and say, we need to have a very intense and very in-depth effort to try to understand what we all need to do in order to protect uh, our, the future of our children and grandchildren. Bill Kinane, um, identify yourself. Director, Director Brennan, uh, I'm Bill Kinane. I'm a <clears throat> retired FBI agent, uh, 34 years. And my last five years I spent as the league at in Moscow. And uh, I've been retired for several years, but my question goes back to the dossier. Uh, when that initially surfaced, wouldn't there have been the thought that uh, this is like uh, an act of measures on the part of the Soviet or Russian intelligence services? Because if, if it was, it, the disruption it's caused has got to be the greatest coup they've ever pulled, in, in, in my knowledge of the history of their, uh, of their activities. Well, certainly it, you know, it could be, you know, and I don't know the, the provenance of the information. I, as I said, I've seen it, uh, the, the, the dossier. Uh, it, is, uh, it was done by a former uh, accomplished member of the British uh, Intelligence Service, MI6. Uh, it is uh, sourced to unnamed sources and some sources uh, that's uh, alleged uh, these types of activities. So I don't know whether or not the information in it, uh, some, all, or none, is valid or not. Uh, could it have been something that uh, Russian intelligence services might have uh, put forward? It might have been. Uh, but uh, I, based on what I know about it and what I know about uh, Christopher Steele, who was responsible for pulling this together, I don't think he would have been uh, uh, manipulated that way by Russian intelligence uh, services. I, I do not believe that he is acting um, on behalf of them. Uh, might he been, have been unwittingly used? Maybe, uh, so I don't know. But uh, this is something that uh, clearly uh, you know, people are, are intrigued over. Uh, so again, I don't want to, to make any statement that will uh, suggest that I know more about uh, it than I, than I do. Thank you. Director Brennan, um, Monica Borland with Mother Jones. Um, moving on from the steel memos a little bit, um, there's been reporting that um, also in the spring and summer of 2016, information reached the U.S. government about um, a drinking session um, by George Papadopoulos, um, who was then a foreign policy advisor to the Trump campaign. Um, and a top Australian diplomat, and uh, that the Australian government passed this on to the U.S. government. I wonder if um, that information was something that reached you in that time frame, and um, did you brief um, the Gang of Eight about this? Is there anything that you can um, help us flesh out that episode? As you know, the CIA is a foreign intelligence agency. And any time that we would encounter in the course of our uh, work, any information related to US persons, we would immediately make that available to the FBI, which does have the jurisdictional authority to deal with that. That's why the CIA and FBI were working very, very closely during this period of time to make sure that all information that needed to be shared was shared. So um, I was aware of, of that information. I'm not going to say from where I learned it, you know, whether I learned it from overseas or from my you know, domestic counterparts, whatever. But that was something that was, I, I know, being uh, looked at and uh, reviewed. But uh, being aware of something like that or even encountering some intelligence that we might have picked up, uh, my continued visibility into it would have ceased because it involved a U.S. person. I take very seriously my, I took very seriously my responsibilities Make, to make sure I was not getting involved in any type of intelligence gathering or collection uh, against U.S. persons. There was only incidental uh, collection, which means that and in the pursuit of foreign intelligence, if we encountered U.S. person information that was of national security or counterintelligence uh, significance, we would uh, pass it on to the, to the Bureau. Uh, John, Tom Fuentes, uh, retired assistant director, FBI. Uh, How are you doing? Hi. 
You may not remember our daughters sat next to each other playing clarinet at Rachel Carson Middle School. Uh, and you and I standing in the back of the room while they were rehearsing, chatting. Uh, yes. Anyway, I, my last five years in the Bureau, I ran the Legal Attaché Program, the FBI's 81 offices outside the U.S. around the world. I know recently talking to many former colleagues and subordinates uh, who are still working overseas that the rhetoric of Trump has had a very severe impact uh, on their relations in those countries, having to defend the FBI and and put up with the uh, you know the trashing that has gone on, especially in the most recent months. Have you heard you know your former colleagues and subordinates around the world are they having the same type of uh, impact, especially the ones that are working with our closest allies like the Five Eyes, the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand? Yes, I have heard similar reports, uh, and for for a variety of reasons. One is that, uh, especially during the, the first year of the Trump administration, where there was some very uh, sort of loose lips about intelligence uh, and sharing of intelligence uh, inappropriately and leaks, including from the Oval Office when maybe foreign foreigners were there. It really, I think, put a chill on some of the uh, other services interest in sharing intelligence with the United States if we were going to treat it so cavalierly at that presidential level. But also, uh, given the fact that there has been such a, a, a negative uh, commentary and view uh, that has been put forth by uh, Mr. Trump and others about uh, the FBI or CIA, uh, I, I do think, and making the allegations about the, it being the, these organizations being politicized, I think it has made it more difficult for um, our intelligence and law enforcement officers to carry out their, their responsibilities and to get the the cooperation that they rely on so heavily from their, their foreign counterparts. And the third, you know, it's really quite interesting, and I was listening very carefully over the past last week at the references to our confidence that Bashar al-Assad carried out those awful, awful uh, chemical weapons attacks in Syria. Uh, and U.S. intelligence was cited time and again. And it appears as though, uh, I think this has been pretty typical, Mr. Trump will be very, very selective in terms of what he points to as valid and true and that which he uh, questions. It's, and so I, one of the concerns that I know intelligence professionals have is that when we really need to convince our partners and allies and even those third parties about the strength of our conviction on some of these issues, such as uh, responsibility for a chemical weapons attack, we really need those uh, individuals to in countries to have confidence that we have the highest professionalism and we're carrying out our duties uh, to the letter of the law and we're not politicized. But uh, when Mr. Trump has continued to, to question the integrity, uh, the validity, uh, the strength of intelligence assessments about Russian interference in the election, it really, I think, makes people scratch their head about Okay, uh, you put great confidence in it in this case, but not in others. So I think just again to your point, Tom, I, I think it has really made a number of uh, those uh, CIA, FBI uh, officers and agents who serve overseas in particular, who have to deal with our liaison partners, puts them in a very difficult position and, and puts them in some respects on the defensive because I could see uh, the foreign intelligence services saying, well, do you do X, do you do Y? Uh, your president is saying that this is a problem. They're saying that there is this cancer within your organizations. Is this true? Uh, that is not something that I think you want our uh, professionals abroad to have to deal with. Given your, um, uh, the opening of the session where Lowell asked you about a recent tweet, um, given your propensity for use of head-scratching words that derive from your education in the classics. Is there anything else we should be looking for in the next few days or weeks? Uh, you know, I think I've tweeted maybe 20 or 22 times or so, uh, but I have um, a number of draft tweets that have... <laughs> <laughs> Would you care to share them with us? <laughs> well, they... <laughs> I think they, they beat Mr. Trump to the dustbin of, of uh, history. Uh, but um, yeah, I'm not going to, I, I don't know. I, you know I, 
there are some days I, I say to myself, I'm not going to tweet again. Uh, there, there are times, and I, I, I have, this is my, my office in my home in my basement, and sometimes I come down here in the morning and we'll pound out a, a draft op-ed uh, that something on something that really has irritated me that day, uh, only to, you know, print it out, read it, and then after I have that great feeling of catharsis, I crumple it up and throw it in the dustbin. <laughs> With the uh, my basement office, <laughs> but uh, there there is a uh, an op-ed that uh, I am working on that I, I probably will decide to go forward to try to explain in more than 280 characters uh, why I'm angry, why I speak out, why this is important, why this is different, why this is something that I am particularly annoyed at how how intentionally deceptive Mr. Trump has been and how that's so corrosive on the foundations of democracy and also how influential in a very negative way it is on young Americans. Uh, that's why I spent a lot of time talking to students. Uh, I'm very proud of this country. I'm a believer in American exceptionalism, not because we're smarter or better than others, but we have had just such tremendous exceptional good fortune over the years. Uh, this wonderful big country uh, huge natural resources, um, great coasts, uh, borders, uh, arable land, navigable rivers, uh, and with the melting pot of the world, we have had the benefits of having people from all over this world come here and, and contribute to this great, great country. And we're special in that regard. And as a son of an immigrant, it's something my father instilled upon me and me and my brother and sister at a very early age, don't ever take for granted just how privileged it is for you to be an American citizen. He had to you know, work for 28 years before he was able to come here and become a, a U.S. person and an American citizen. And exceptionally proud of it. And I am too. And uh, every time the president speaks, every time he, he acts, the eyes of the world and the ears of the world are upon him. And I have not found in the last 15 months or so that Mr. Trump understands the responsibility, nor is capable of living up to it. And that's why, and even if it comes at the cost of fine personal financial reward, I don't care. This country means more to me uh, than my, my pocketbook. So uh, I think I will tweet again. <laughs> I think I will write those op-eds. I think I will continue to speak out. And that's why, and I'm, and I'm I'm sorry I'm not able to enjoy the wonderful Berkeley environment there, but the Lowell asked me to do this. And when others, for whatever reason, and I respect them, were not able to speak out, uh, I like to think that I'm giving voice to, to their concerns that are, I think, similar. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, John. Go enjoy your dinner, and I'll see you soon. Okay, thanks, Paul. Thanks Thank everybody. you, Rebecca.